All right. I'm going to get us kicked off here. So first things first, my name is Bill Bench. I'm an operating partner here at Battery. Welcome to our sixth Sound Bites episode, this time with our guest Stacey Epstein from Freshworks. And joining me from the Battery side is Darmesh Thacker, one of the general partners here. I'll do some intros here in just a moment. But before we dive in today's topics, just a couple of quick announcements. This will be the last sound bites we're going to do for a couple of months as we take a break through the summer. And when we do return, I think we're going to be experimenting with a new uh, a new way of delivering it. We're going to do it as a podcast that we record. Uh, a lot of the feedback we've gotten is that it's hard for people to make the specific times and they ask for the recording anyways. So we're going to try it that way and uh, ask for people to pre-submit their questions and dive in that way. Um, so look for that as we return in late summer. Secondly, speaking of late summer, Battery will be hosting our annual sales summit this August 17th in San Francisco. If you are a CRO or a VP of sales, someone leading the revenue function inside your business, feel free to reach out to me at bbench at battery.com for more details. But we're uh, we, this is an annual event that we do, and we're looking forward to having over 100 CROs and VPs of sales in the room talking about some of the tough topics that are going on out there. So with that, that's it for the announcements. Let's dive over to today's topic. Uh, I'm super excited and enthused to be joined by Stacey Epstein. Um, Stacey, as I mentioned, is the CMO of Freshworks. She and I have known each other for more than 25 years, having both started our careers at Oracle back in the, uh, in the 90s, back in the last century, in the 1900s, as they say. Um, but uh, Stacey grew her career like a lot of us did. She started her her career there, got a lot of great training, and then moved up through different roles inside of different companies, including startups and some other big companies like Infor, uh, until she landed at a company that I think a lot of us have heard about, Success Factors, which she helped take public as their VP of global marketing. Um, having taken that experience, or have having had that experience, she took that, that skill set and went over to be the CMO at ServiceMax, where she served for several years before leaving with the itch to go be a CEO, which she did with a company called Zinc that ServiceMax then acquired back. And Stacy did the ultimate boomerang going back as their CMO. Today, now she's the CMO of Freshworks that she's been with since before they went public. She's a board member and an all around outstanding friend of sales. So if you ever wanna work with a, a wonderful marketing person that's aligned with sales, this is the person. So welcome Stacy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Awesome. Well, it's great to have you here. Uh, one of the things we've been doing on the Sound Bites podcast is we've been inviting someone else to join me. And uh, this week we have Darmesh Thacker, who's a general partner, has been here at Battery about nine years. So Darmesh, thanks for joining me to saddle up today. No, thank you very much for having me, Bill. I'm excited to be here. Great. Well, Stacy, as we chatted about earlier, there are really three topics that we were hoping to dive into. Number one is the classic sales and marketing alignment topic. Number two is delving into generative AI, something that's much ado on everybody's minds right now. And then thirdly, uh, back into the marketing world is marketing metrics that matter, how you measure and uh, think about yourself. Now, I'll let you know one thing before we dive in, Stacy. Our audience spans pretty wide, a wide uh, breadth of companies, but probably most of them are in the, you know, $1 million to $100 million range. So as you think about your questions, just know that that's a lot of our audience that's listening in here today. Awesome. Well, let's dive in. So uh, pretty straightforward place to start here that I think a lot of companies think about, Stacy, is that you and your experience in the past, as well as today at Freshworks, have had to sell across a variety of places. So if you think about things from a segmentation perspective, small, mid-market, or large enterprise, you've had to sell across geographies, and you've had to do that with multiple product lines. That in and of itself creates a lot of complexity in the go-to-market motion. So I'm curious, how do you think about a framework for your marketing message to be able to train SDRs, train AEs, train partners, sales engineers, whoever else to be able to, to have a concise, crisp message. Sure. Um, and I'll add just to kind of center us as we're talking about sales and marketing and GTM alignment. Um, the, the maybe uninteresting part of my background that you didn't mention, but maybe the most impactful is that very early in my career, I was a direct sales rep. 
um, I carried a bag at a very early CRM company called Clarify. And um, I, I sat in that seat and I, and I understand how it felt to need great marketing and positioning to be successful. And I'm guessing that 99% of people on this call are too young to remember Clarify. Um, but Clarify had a really powerful, incredible product. And then out of nowhere came Siebel. And, um, you know, newer, maybe not as deep in product features, but their marketing was just incredible. Uh, built a great brand, really strong value proposition. And I would show up in the first conversation with a prospect and they would say, you know, nice to meet you, Stacy. Tell me why I shouldn't just go with Siebel. And, and like I lived what it feels like to compete against a marketing powerhouse. And I found myself always in the, in the VP of marketing's office going, this is, you know, we're, what we're saying isn't resonating. It's not what customers need. This is what I'm competing against. This is what Siebel's saying. We can't just rest on our laurels because we have a better product because I can't win these deals. They're predisposed to go with Siebel before I even walk in the door. Um, and honestly, that's how I realized that marketing was my calling. And from there, I kind of moved into a, a marketing role, um, like creating my own decks because I felt like our corporate deck wasn't hitting the mark. And, and I think I've taken that experience with me for decades as I've led marketing and really focused on what does sales need to win deals? And that's like the ultimate question that I think every marketer should keep with them. Um, and I think a lot of marketers don't do that. They're busy with like, what's the market saying? And you like, ultimately, all that matters is that deals are closing. Literally, that's the only thing that matters in the company is that we are generating revenue. Product needs to think about that. Marketing needs to think about that. We're sort of all in service to that point of revenue when a sales rep closes a deal. Now, maybe it's PLG, right? Maybe that deal's happening online and not through a rep. But that moment of revenue is all that matters. And we all kind of lose sight on that. And um, and and I think it, even I, even my team, sometimes we have to make ourselves come back around to, but like, are we giving the sales reps what they need to win business? And whether that's air cover and brand, whether that's pipeline leads, demand generation, whether that's, as you described, enablement materials, like is the deck working? Are they really learning how to communicate the value proposition? Did I give them a good email sequence to really get somebody like it all comes back to, am I giving them what they need? And, you know, it's fairly easy to judge. Am I giving them what they need? One is in metrics, which I know we're going to talk about. Um, so I'll save metrics for another time. But the other part is ask them like, I, you know, honestly, I could tell you who I think is doing a great job on the marketing team, partially because of what I hear from sales, right? If sales comes back and says, oh my gosh, those events that we're running in, in, you know, Asia are killing it. Like great people showing up, deals are coming out of it really qual Like then I know, okay, we've got a winning strategy and we're probably doing a good job there. If they come to me and say, these, these events are a waste of time, I'm spending my time getting people there and it's not compelling, right? I just picked events as one, but it, it's across the board. It's not just the marketing metrics that you need to pay attention to, pay attention to. It's literally listening to is what I'm doing, helping sales close deals, because that's all that really matters. So look, you just opened up. Uh, a whole number of areas there that I'm sure Darmesh and I are both thinking about. But let me ask one question and I'll I'll let Darmesh jump in with one. But you said something really important there. And uh, in the name of this this webinar series is Soundbite. So it's kind of going to become a soundbite just to let you know. But you said, what does sales need to do? I'm sorry, what does marketing need to do to win deals? Um, to help sales win deals. To help sales win deals, right. yes. Um, that's the only thing that that matters. Then you went on to talk about things like decks. You talked about leads. You talked about events and stuff like that. How do you think about keeping that fresh? Because that's 
that's always part of one of the problems being in sales, right? Is you get trained on something and then you go out to battle with it and then it changes. Like how frequently can you do that? How do you keep it fresh? How do you keep it exciting? How do you iterate your marketing message that's going over to sales? Yeah, it's hard. It's a, it's, there's no easy answer to that question um, because there's a, there's, you're always walking the line between keeping things fresh and not completely confusing everybody and, and losing the audience because they don't have the patience to relearn new materials on a monthly basis. Um, our, our world is changing very quickly and I know we're all experiencing it. Um, we went from everything was hunky dory and things were growing fast. And then we went into COVID and we, everyone was like, oh no, the world's going to shut down. And then we went into, oh, actually the world's still, you know, software's still a big deal during COVID. Everything's turned up. And then we came out of COVID and we thought everything was good. And then the macro came at us and it was like, oh no, like everyone's cutting their tech stack. What do we do? And then generative AI hit the scene. And now it's like, oh gosh, we better put AI into our messaging. So I think as marketers, that's it's really hard to navigate such a changing dynamic for our sellers. Um, my best advice, and again, there's no perfect answer, is that you have to really truly understand your core value proposition and your core value proposition should define not what your features are. It should define, and I'll try to make this a sound bite, your core value proposition defines what you mean to your buyer. And I said that slow because again, we all think we all look inward and we look at our own feet. Let me tell you why my features are so great. We are the most powerful AI engine for automating customer service. That does not put it into the frame of what does what does it mean to my buyer? Um, and I even like we 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 have a really big launch coming in two days. And if you're interested in Freshworks, sign up for it on our website. But, um, you know, we're doing the final slides and I'm sort of doing that. Is it in the words of the buyer test? And it's so hard to do. It's like, you know, we deliver amazing omni-channel service supercharged with Gen AI. And I'm like, but guys, what does that mean to the buyer? Is the buyer going to deflect more cases, therefore leading to a more efficient operation? Are their agents going to be able to move faster? Are they going to reduce churn? Like really understanding what you mean to the buyer is crucial. I'm going to come back to how do you enable teams? Because I, I know that was your question. But once you really understand what is your core value proposition to your buyer, that shouldn't really change. As you're introducing new features, um, you know, you may be adding on elements to what it is that we do. But if you really have done a good job of understanding your core value proposition to your market, then I think as all these things come in and change, um, you're better able to bring your sales team along with it. And then it's more of like a here, a refresh, an update. Um, you know, I think we're all a little on our heels dealing with how quickly Gen AI hit the market. And I know we'll talk about that too, but, um, you know, Gen AI should be supercharging what your core value proposition already is. You shouldn't be creating something entirely new. Yeah. Um, but, but I do think a lot of communication with your sellers and understanding where they are, um, and, and trying not to throw new stuff at them all the time, but more of like bringing them along with like, you know, maybe it's a new chapter or it's a new update. Stacey, you want to talk about that while you're at it? I mean, look, there's a lot of noise from generative AI, but you also said it should superpower your message, not distract you. So if you think about the different dimensions of marketing, you think about product marketing and messaging, demand generation, branding, in the context of Freshworks, how are you guys thinking about using generative AI effectively in those three areas? And maybe you have an example or two you can provide. And by the same token, like where is it totally buzz and like, you know, just stay away from that if there's any advice. Yeah, I mean, I I think of course it all has to come from what are you actually doing with Gen AI, right? Like just talking about how great your Gen AI strategy is in the absence of any real product strategy is obviously not what anyone should do. So 
Uh, you know, I work very, very closely with our head, our chief product officer, as well as our CEO and our president on like, what is our vision for Gen AI from a product perspective? So it has to be rooted in, in fact. Um, and if you go to the Freshworks web website right now, you will not see AI all over our homepage. And part of that is by design. Like I said, we have a big launch coming on Thursday with, and, and that's when you'll kind of see everything turn. We'll be announcing a bunch of new features and capabilities around Gen AI. Um, so I, I do think, once again, I'm all about being genuine. Um, and and like, what is actually the strategy? What is actually the vision from a product perspective? And then it's a matter of framing that up for your buyers. But again, what does it mean to them? I mean, we're in a, we're in a kind of a, we have to walk a fine line at Freshworks because we cater largely to customer service and IT service teams. And when you look at the bigger picture around Gen AI and, you know, quote, loss of jobs, they often go to those agent type of activities where the job's going to go away. And that's a little bit of a scary place to be when you're selling solutions like that. Because on the one hand, what's the value to the buyer? The value to the buyer is that they can do more work with less agents. It's a it's an uncomfortable thing to put on your website. Like, yeah, we're going to help you reduce a bunch of jobs because it's such a touchy topic in the world at large. Um, so, and I'm, I'm getting into more details on our own strategy, but it is that supercharging agents. It is evolving your operations to where you can do, you know, that you can deflect the things that can be done by technical technological automation through Gen AI. And you can then empower your existing workers to do more, do better, do faster. Um, we also sell to developers who are building apps on our marketplace and their ability to like churn out new integrations and new apps. Like you're, it's that supercharging theme, at least for us. Um, but I think a lot of thought and energy has gone into how do you, how do we really frame up what that means to the, to the buyer? And now Stacey, you, you talked about a lot about generative AI in the context of how you position the Freshworks message to the customer. What about taking it inwards? Like, you know, internally, how are you using it for the way SDRs or reps reach out to customers or the way you prioritize your leads? Are there internal workflows or augmentation opportunities for you within the, the marketing scope? Yeah. And I, and I, 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 I want to make one more comment about positioning too, um, because it, I'm going to bring it around to what I talked about with value prop. Um, so you may have seen our tagline at Freshworks is delight made easy. And again, you know, back to what I said, what does it mean to the buyer? Um, and, and when we, when we pre IPO kind of came to that tagline, it was all about the fact that, um, our value prop is that we make it really fast and easy to build out full customer service, employee service, um, sales, marketing automation, have really, you know, very robust and modern tech stack in those areas at a fraction of the time expense and resources required than say Salesforce, ServiceNow, even Zendesk, right? That's our value prop. You can have the most modern, powerful tech stack for CRM and ITSM at a fraction of the time, cost, resources, right? That's delight made easy. When when Gen AI hit the scene, and I I know we talked about this before, but McKinsey put out a study called um, "What Every CEO Needs to Know About Generative AI," and I encourage everybody to read it. It's um, really educational as we're all um, navigating through Gen AI. But my first reaction was, if I'm a mid market CEO, which is largely who we sell to at Freshworks, I'm super nervous because I'm told I need a a data science team. I need a chief data science officer. I need a really complicated strategy about my data infrastructure. And I'm just a mid-market or a SMB CEO trying to make margins. 
And now suddenly I've got to have this whole data strategy team. And guess what? Those people don't exist for me to hire. I mean, the, you want to go out and hire a, a head of AI at your small business or your mid-market company, you're not going to find it. Like those, those, that talent is probably the most scarce talent there is out there, right? So there's fear and panic in a lot of CEOs and, 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 and leaders, especially at the mid-market and SMB and a lot of non-tech companies. I come back to our core value proposition, which is delight made easy. Our core value proposition is that now with Gen AI is that we're going to bring AI to all of those leaders by building it into our product. And we're going to make it fast and easy and cost effective for them to implement Gen AI strategies. And so now we're evolving. We'll still have delight made easy. It's our core value proposition, but we're evolving the notion of AI made easy. And if you tune into our launch on Thursday, you'll see a big slide that our CEO starts with that says AI for the Fortune 5 million, not the Fortune 500. Like we're going to bring AI to the masses. We're going to make it fast. We're going to make it easy. And I think it's an example of what we talked about. Core value prop doesn't change, right? Fast, easy, low, you know, cost effective, and yet still modern and powerful. We are just now applying the gen AI lens to that. And I think that kind of ties what a lot of what we've talked and talked about core value prop. How do you iterate it for your teams? So I just wanted to make that point. Now, internally, well, A, we use our own products, right? So we use fresh marketer and marketing. We use fresh sales as our sales. I mean, we use our CRM. So we have the benefit of leveraging gen AI in our own products. Um, and we've been leveraging it a fair amount. Um, I think it's great for testing, um, you know, testing of, of landing page content, testing of email subject. Um, I think it's pretty decent for some content generation for sure. Um, it's definitely great for content generation of like, you know, you're a customer service agent and you want to understand exactly how to respond. Um, it's great for that. I, for me, where it stops is there's a level of cre creativity that humans will always have over and above what Gen AI can do. And, you know, Gen AI by nature is pouring through everything that's ever been written to come up with this new thing that you've asked it to do. And if you really want to get ahead of the game in, let's say, content creation, and you really want something different and creative, you still need humans to do that. Um, and so we we definitely like to use it for, like I said, testing, for you know generation of things where you just want it to be good and pulling from history is important. But again, if I want that really cutting edge white paper that's going to drive a bunch of SEO and and um, and growth marketing for me, I need it, I need it to be fresh and new and not just a mixture of everything else that's already been written in the past. I think, um, Stacy, on that, I, I heard a great analogy last week. Someone brought up the calculator and they compared it to AI. And they said, you know, people thought that calculators were an easy way out. We're going to make human beings dumber. Um, where in reality, what we had to do was learn how to incorporate this new technology into our, our flows, if you will. And today we use them for the better. Um, and so I think that that AI, like, I think what you're saying is AI has that element that there's existing workflows, your core value prop is still your core value prop, but there's this new, as we just talked about, supercharged technology that's going to come out and change the way that we do things. And we just need to learn how to incorporate it into our business. Yeah, it's funny. I'm, um, I totally agree. I am headed to New York in a couple of days with my husband for a wedding and, and I haven't been in a couple of years. And so I asked um, chat GPT where I should go out to dinner. And I was like, okay, no, <laughs> like, these are so old. You know, it's just like, it's obviously not going to give me like the cutting edge. Here's the right answer current because it's just looking through past, you know? So I really do think we have to put our human lens on everything we get out of Jen. AI for sure. And I mean, again, if you tune into our keynote, you'll hear our CEO um, in the beginning of his conversation, he talks about like people have been afraid of machines replacing jobs for centuries. I mean, go back to the industrial revolution. 
right? It was like, oh no, like all these machines are going to replace our jobs. And yet along the way, human beings have continued to just prove that leveraging the technology can make the world a better place. It's not going to get rid of all of us. And one more point on that. Um, it's funny. So we already taped this launch that we're showing virtually on Thursday. We taped it live in San Francisco. And one of the, one of the guys that we did, we had a, there's a section about building marketplace apps um, and how easy it is to generate code using Gen AI. And there was a, one of our partners in the audience raised his hand and he said, you know, that was really so great to see. I feel like even I could be a coder. And, and the answer is that's where we're headed is that, you know, somebody who today is a customer service agent tomorrow might be building apps because it's just as easy. Um, you don't need to like go get a, an advanced degree in data science or in engineering to, to code. Um, so I think that, you know, optimistic view about Gen AI really changing the world, but for the better. And um, I, that's certainly what I subscribe to. Yeah, it's great. Stacy, can I, coming back to metrics and, um... The reality of living in marketing and sales today. I mean, look, it's it's been a tough few quarters, you know, in the macro, given all the kind of interest rate concerns and the like. And your message around, hey, everybody should be aligned on how to sell and delight customers, uh, as you mentioned. In that world where marketing and sales are aligned on targeting and selling and delighting customers, what do you think? Is there a place for like? I hear marketing attribution to leads and sales attribution to leads. Like, does that even exist in your world where everybody's aligned? And then a follow-on question to that is, how important is marketing to upsell? Because more and more revenue comes from upselling versus historically marketing has been interested in landing deals, right? So can you comment on both of those topics? Uh-huh. Um, attribution ha has always been a really challenging part of marketing. Um, I mean, I've been doing this, as Bill said, since the 90s. And there, in my mind, there's still no perfect answer to attribution. Honestly, I think it's one of the ways that Gen AI is going to really power us is to be able to really give me answers on what is moving the needle in deals. We're still in a world where you have to decide, is it first touch? Is it last touch? Is it all touches? But what about the fact that there are 10 different people involved in the sales cycle and they all had multiple touches? And how do I value, you know, what the head of customer service participated in versus the CIO? And do I really know who, like all of those things make attribution really hard. And I think we all kind of, based on how we run our business, make our best guess but it's never been perfect. And in my opinion, it's still not perfect. I, you know, for the longest time, I would say, you know, and I spent a good chunk of my career in more early stage, kind of maybe more like our audience in more early stage growth, growth stage companies. And I, I was always really focused on not trying to divide up what sales does and what marketing does, because it, it a, it, it's, Again, my philosophy is we're all working together to generate pipeline and nobody's doing an outbound call without leveraging positioning from marketing, without leveraging a white paper for somebody to download, to get them interested in an email or invite them to an event like outbounding. You can't be successful outbounding without leveraging marketing. And the same thing is true with driving inbound. Like you drive in leads and demand into your site. And unless you're pure PLG, those are getting followed up on by a rep. So I, I always hated separating out. We do separate out those metrics at Freshworks at scale. And, and, I, and there's good reason for it. We really do. I do think that um, if you just combine it all together, it makes it really easy for salespeople to not outbound. And when the metric is one big metric, and you know, let's just call it pipeline. Like, how are we doing on pipeline for a particular product and a particular reason? And if that's a jointly owned metric by sales and marketing, it's really easy for sales to just hide and say, yeah, it's just the outbounding's not working. But if you divide it up and say, no, like inbound is going to be judged based on 
inbound is really truly a marketing sourced activity and outbounding is probably a combination of marketing and sales at least they're leveraging marketing but it's really an, an a sales owned metric then nobody really gets off the hook and and can hide behind metrics so i've kind of come around to it not just being a shared metric but having individual targets for each motion um, but again, there's no perfect way. And I think a lot of companies do it really differently. And I am very hopeful that Gen AI can help us get a lot better attribution in pouring through all the data that we have. Um, Stacey, this topic of metrics is probably one of the most common ones that I talk about with the portfolio companies I work with is what metrics should we look at? What are the sales and marketing alignment ones? And no surprise, when we when we announced this session, some of the questions that were pre-submitted, um, the most questions that were pre-submitted were in this area. So let me just take a shot here. We have a live one that I thought I'd just do right now. What are the key metrics you track regarding sales and marketing and collaboration on sales? What are some of the KPIs that uh, that you focus on to support this? Yeah. Um... Let's see, let me kind of take it at the various levels. So um, as a man, and remember, we are a public at scale company with multiple product lines operating in every single region of the world. And there's a level of having to understand your metrics by product, by region, even down to by country. And some countries are handled by partners and some are handled by our direct team and that will drive some different metrics, right? So it get, and can get complex really fast. Um, at a management team level, we look at the, the highest level metrics. In fact, we just had our weekly management meeting. We're coming up on the end of quarter now. Um, we look at revenue, we look at pipeline, we look at churn. Um, we think those are really, you know, it's always like distance to the goal for the quarter, right? But as a management team, we're centering on those main metrics by product, by region. And for the most part, on a weekly basis, it's hard to get into any level of detail because everything, all, you know, once you get into regions and products, they're all different. So then we're starting to look at hot areas, either green hot or red hot, right? If something's really doing well in a certain region or across the globe, you know, should we consider doubling down? Should we put more fuel on that business? Or like, wow, we're really struggling in this particular region for this particular product. Now let's go under the covers, right? And then we get into the, what's the marketing team focused on? Um, and for, just to add complexity, at Freshworks, we have a very specific PLG inbound, get into the trial, convert through the trial business. We also have that direct enterprise motion through salespeople, and those have different metrics, right? With, with the PLG, PLG side of the business, it's actually a lot easier. Um, it's an inbound, you know, did we get them to the trial? Are we hitting those raw lead numbers of the trial? You can back up before that to like, are you know, is it SEO? Is it SEM? Right, there's metrics there. But the, but the true number is, are we getting enough people into the trial? And then what are the conversion points in the trial? Are enough, you know, how, what's, how many of them are converting into actually using the product? That's a really important metric. And then obviously how many of them are sticking around after they convert into the product. So PLG is pretty straightforward. For us um, on the enterprise motion, we do all touch attribution. I don't know if it's perfect. It's what we're doing right now. It's just, we calculate every touch that they had and we give them points um, so that we can understand ROI. Um, so again, I would say pipeline is a bigger metric for us than leads. Um, leads gets kind of fuzzy when you get into enterprise, um, but certainly pipeline attainment, um, conversion rates, deal size obviously matters because you have to hit your numbers. Um, and trying to think of anything else that really, I mean, ROI, right? Like, am I overpaying? What's my payback period? So those are, that's really important too, because you need to understand what should I keep doing or not doing. So those are the key metrics. I would say for upsell, 
I think marketing absolutely should play a role in upsell. And as we've seen, as the market and the economy started to turn, everyone was saying, oh, the best thing to do is go sell more to your existing customers. Um, you know, we do have a customer marketing team. It is a demand gen team and it lives in demand gen. We have also an advocacy team that does case studies that lives in comms for us, separate teams. The customer marketing team in demand gen is driving leads for our farmers. We do have account manager slash farmers that have revenue numbers. Um, and a lot of it for us is just cross, cross product pollination, right? Like, and we do a fair amount of, of data around propensity to buy. And, you know, based on a number of attributes, if they're already using our customer service solution, we should go sell them marketing, or we should go sell them sales, or we should get their IT side of the house interested in using it for ITSM. So, and we have metrics, we have leads, we have pipeline that we're accountable, and it's all around customer upsell. And on that, um, I'll paraphrase a question that came in, but it's also a common thought is, as you think about downstream, I think a lot of people agree with you that leads is probably not a great place to be measuring. That's kind of getting deep into the engine room of marketing. But when you think about where your pipeline should be coming from, do you think about the source of it, i.e. PLG, sales generated, marketing generated, that type of thing? Do you, do you build goals and budgets around those different categories? We do. Um, and I will say, I don't have a like particular hard and fast rule. Um, we do an AOP annual operating plan exercise, um, which we will be kicking off actually pretty soon for next year. Um, it is a, a multi-month long project. And there's a lot of discussion and negotiation around all of those. And it's not just the like, you know, you can just say, oh, sales owns this, marketing owns this, let's go to the races. But there is an ultimate revenue goal that you're both trying to hit together. And so there's kind of that top down. And then there's also the bottoms up way of looking at it. Like I can only generate so many leads with this amount of dollars. And I know that because I understand my ROI. And so this is what I can sign up for with leads. Well, if our conversion rates today mean that that's not going to lead me to my revenue goal, then what gives, right? Am I going to ask for more money? Probably not happening right now. Should I try to have better quality leads that convert better? Sure. And I might have to sign up for an improved conversion rate in my marketing leads. Are the deal sizes going to go up? I mean, I think we're all in a world right now where deal sizes are not necessarily going up for anybody. And by the way, like all those, like I'm growing really fast. I'm adding seats. I'm adding seats. I'm adding that evaporated, right? So we're right. all like, that's why you shouldn't have a hard and fast rule because everything's a little bit of a discussion and a negotiation, but it has to be done like rev ops, mark ops, sales, marketing leaders, and finance is involved, right? You got to hit, you want to hit that revenue number. What's all the mix of things and the conversion rates and like deal sizes that all has to be taken in to consideration when you're signing up for what the targets are. And, you know, as it always happens, halfway through the year, the markets change, you have new dynamics. Are you going to alter the AOP? Are you going to shift money? Um, but those are things that all, I think, really are conversations where you need to be in lockstep with sales and and really finance. Yeah. Stacey, can I, can I ask you on that? I think there's a fascinating discussion just in terms of aligning sales, finance, marketing, sales ops. Uh, can I ask you, what's your thought on, in this market, you know, are you focused much more on like filling top of funnel to maximize your shots on goal? Are you much more focused on targeted mid funnel conversion? Because I've had mixed reviews. You know, some marketers' response to these market conditions is filling more top of funnel. Others are much more deliberate about like closing more POCs to close deals. So. Where in that funnel are you optimizing um, given these market conditions? I would say I we haven't looked at it specifically that way. Um, you know, we're in kind of an interesting position where even though we're a pretty big company and at scale, we're still not nearly as well known as our competitors. And we compete against Salesforce and ServiceNow and Zendesk. And, you know, not everybody knows who Freshworks is. 
And it's tough because we were, you know, we were kind of amping up that brand awareness bucket. That's the one area where we've had to pull back a little bit in the economy is just less brand. It's hard to measure the ROI and we really want to hit revenue numbers. So I would say, but in terms of like top of funnel versus middle funnel, we haven't made as much of a distinction there. Um, I would say our biggest focus has been on driving efficiency. I mean, we're not going to just spend a bunch more money to hit the the same numbers as a public company. Like that's the opposite of what we want to do. We want to hit the same numbers, but spend less money. And so where we've been focused, again, it's less on top of funnel versus middle funnel, but more on where have we been spending money that hasn't been moving the needle and how can we get way more efficient in our operations? Got it. Got it. Good. Uh, Stacy. as we come up on the end here, uh, one final question. I'm going to go back to some of the pre-submitted questions. Staying on the metrics topic, this question seems to come out in almost every, every chat we do, but uh, is there a single metric that marketing and sales leaders can agree on that's measurable and uh, correctable, uh, something that you can, that you can action uh, uh, as two teams working together? Pipeline. It's got to be pipeline. It's got to be pipeline. And pipeline is the biggest indicator. Um, and I'll tell a funny story. Way back in my early days as a marketing leader, um, and I was working with Dave Yarnold, who uh, I think you know, and he was the head of sales at Success Factors and then became the CEO at ServiceMax. And I remember going into my performance review and being like, you know, this will be fun. I always get good performance reviews. I'm doing a good job. And he said, you know, there's something I really need to talk to you about that you really need to work on. And I was like, oh no, okay. And he said, I don't think that you are personally taking accountability for pipeline. And I'll never forget it. You know, this was like 20 years ago for me. And it just hit home that I do think I was like leads, leads, leads and top of funnel and brand. And, and I was kind of just letting sales own the pipeline number. And, um, and it really changed how I, how I think about marketing and how I lead my teams. Now I'm obviously less accountable or I'm less able to control wins because once it does go into a sales cycle, it's much more owned by sales. But man, pipeline has got to be, if anything, it should be marketing's metric and not sales metric. Like they should take it and run with it, right? But I think um, aligning to that as a joint and whether it's region, region, product, product, for us, it's a lot of complexity, but I think it's just got to be pipeline. I, I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, you know, Dharmesh hosts uh, an annual CEO event called Open Cloud. And this last one he did in November of 22, we had uh, Chris Degnan, the CRO of Snowflake, come in, mm-hmm. and he talked about this exact thing. He said at their board meetings, the CMO comes in and talks about pipeline, and he talks about conversion. Yeah, you know, his job is converting the pipeline. The marketing team is setting the spike um, up for them. So I think that uh, it's kind of an easy question, but it's always interesting to get into the yeah. mind of the CMO to hear. Yeah. And Do you have time for one more quick question here? Yeah. Stacey, I know we talked a lot about go-to-market, sales, marketing alignment. What about the product side of the house? I mean, the marketing is the first touch point to a lot of prospects, a lot of early customer interactions. How does your team at Freshworks kind of work with the product team to share that feedback, to guide the roadmap, um, kind of align with the product team as well? Any tips there you can share with our audience? I mean, it's equally super, super important. Um, I And I mentioned, as I, I was talking about evolving that our gen AI value prop. I mean, countless hours I'm spending directly with our chief product officer talking about what's coming out of the pipeline and, and not only um, shaping that into the narrative that we put into the market, which we do together, um, but also riffing together on what is the roadmap and what's coming. I mean, we do have, as marketers, we should really be on the pulse of what's happening in the market and what do customers want. And I talked about my early days as a sales rep and, and, you know, pounding on the marketing team's door saying, Hey, the value it's not resonating. The decks aren't resonating, 
But there's also an aspect of, and I know what that exciting feature that Siebel has that I don't have is, and I'm going to take that to product too and say, we need this, we need this, we need this. And, you know, sales has a good perspective on that. Um, but I think marketing should take accountability for being on the pulse of what the market really wants and feeding that back into product. And so it's this continuum of like, we're helping shape roadmap. Um, roadmap gets identified and then we're shaping the message back to the market. But it's a constant collaboration um, that I think people think of marketing and product as very separate parts of the customer life cycle, but they're actually really quite close to each other. Great. That's awesome, Stacey. Thank you so much for sharing your perspectives. Yeah. Thanks for yeah, having me. Yeah, Stacey, it's great to join. One thing uh, we do at the end of every sound bites is we offer to our guest speaker a choice. And I don't have them physically with me because this is the first time I haven't done this from my home office where I have them, but we offer every speaker a choice. You get to choose between two sets of Ray Bans, either Wayfarer or Aviator. And here's before you answer, we take a vote. We get to know the speakers ahead of time and internally the whole production team here at Battery votes on what side we think you're going to go. So you always, someone always gets disappointed here. So what do you think? Do you want to, do you want aviators or do you want wayfarers? Oh, I'm, I'm um, looking at, I want to make sure I remember which is which. Oh my gosh. But the aviators know. are like the, uh, the top yeah. guns, you know, the, the I, glass. Yeah, I, yeah. God, I've always worn the wayfarers. But I think I might change and go aviator this time around. Wow. Wow. Okay. Uh, I, everybody was betting wayfarers for you. So uh, you threw I think us. I'm uh, trying to change it up. Now you threw us a curveball. That's good. Let's keep us on our toes. Um, anyways, Stacey, uh, and, and for all the folks that joined us today, thank you so much. For yeah, it was fun. Us. We love getting together with with sales and marketing leaders just to riff on some of the topics out there. And I knew from our our background of coming up around the same time, starting our careers at Oracle, you'd be a really great guest to join us. So thanks for joining in today. That was great. I had a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. Perfect. Take care of yourself. Okay. You too. All right. Bye-bye.